Hi, and welcome to Failureology, a podcast about engineering failures. I'm your host, Nicole. And I'm Brian, and we're both from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thank you again to our Patreon subscribers. We really, really appreciate your support. For those of you who haven't described, for less than the cost of a really bad bottle of wine, I mean like a really bad bottle of wine, you can hear us talk about more interesting engineering failures. For reference, it's $5 Canadian a month to hear us talk about a bunch more interesting mini failures. I, I don't even know if you can get something that would even qualify as wine for $5. Like, that seems really, really inexpensive. I think it's possible. Challenge accepted. Please don't send us your recommendations for less than $5 <laughs> bottles of wine. I will not be drinking them. I'm pretty sure they're probably vinegar. Maybe. I don't know. It sounds like a fun game. So we have a little bit of a confession. Uh, we recorded the entire last episode talking about Harbor K. And then after we finished recording, we wondered if it was perhaps pronounced Harbor Key instead of K. It looks like K to me. I'm not entirely convinced it's Key. It It's spelt like K. Who spells key like that? I don't know. English is English is hard. It's my first and only language. I'm still not really sure what I'm reading sometimes. I don't know. I think it actually is key because I remember reading a book about this in elementary school, and I believe the origin is Cajun. Okay, well, we already did it and we said K. So if you kept yelling at the radio during the last episode that it's key, not K, we're sorry. We're not beach people. We don't have keys in Alberta. We're landlocked I have, over I have here. many keys. They are on a keychain, key ring, and it goes in my pocket. Well, those are spelled regularly. Anyway, we, apo- we apologize for our Canadianness and our lack of understanding on how to possibly potentially pronounce that word. I'm still not entirely convinced, but you're right. It probably is key, but it's too late because we already did it, so... No take backsies. Well, we should move on to the engineering news for this week, which is all about surgical sticky tape to repair your gastrointestinal tract, which doesn't sound at all gross. <laughs> the picture the picture from the article is a little bit um, gross looking. Really, really interesting um, product. But when, you know, it's a little messy, it's kind of... It's kind of gross a little bit. I had aspirations at one point to go to medical school. And then in biology in grade 11, there was a unit all about plants. And that kind of sunk my my potential medical school career. But I do think this is actually really cool. And I, I do really like medical things, even though I've never gone to medical school. I haven't even played a doctor on TV. <laughs> Important to note, though, as engineers, biology is not our strong science. We are physics people. A little bit of chemistry. Very little biology. It's not our strength. You aren't wrong on that one. All right. So <laughs> on to the actual engineering news, since that's what we should be talking about in this segment. So the sticky tape that they, they invented, um, it was developed by some engineers at, at MIT. And like duct tape to a pipe, this actually works for, for repairing holes and leaks in your gastrointestinal tract. Strong, flexible, and biocompatible These are sticky patches that can be quickly and easily applied to tears and wounds in tissues and other organs. So, like, flex seal for your guts. What an interesting visual. (laughs) Oh, like from the infomercial, you know, the one that has the giant tank of water and the water spraying out. And the the guy with the beard, I think he's got a beard, it's like slaps the tape on. Like that, but hopefully you're having less leakage out of your gastrointestinal tract at that point. So currently, from what I understand, these tears are repaired with surgical sutures, which can trigger scarring and also allow secondary tears on adjacent tissue. So not a super good way to repair these, but not really a better way at this time until we have this surgical tape. Brian, did you know that the leakage rate for GI tract repairs is 20%? Nicole, I did not know that, but... Any time where you have leakage and it relates to your body, that's not good. It should be pretty much 0%. 20% are not good odds. I, I mean, That's not it, good. It's, it's better than 50% leakage, right? Like 20% is much better than 50%. Yeah, not good. I not, 
I didn't like that number. Yeah. So this adhesive that they invented, it, it binds within seconds. Great. Can hold for over a month. Also great. Which is long enough for the tear to heal in most cases. So, so this sounds like an ideal solution to this problem. So the tape is flexible. It can expand and contract with the organ as it heals. Also good. Over time, the tape dissolves without causing inflammation and sticking to surrounding tissue. Also great. It's like a, a band-aid that you don't have to peel off. So the engineering team started out to create double-sided tape, but after consulting with surgeons, they thought that single-sided would work better and have a larger impact with more applications. If you want to read more on the surgical sticky tape, check out the links to sources on the webpage for this episode at failurology.ca. This week's episode of Failurology is brought to you by CRISPR. Not the genetic engineering technique, but your vegetable CRISPR. Actually, this isn't a sponsor. It's a PSA. You should probably clean out your vegetable CRISPR. There's definitely a cucumber or box of mixed greens you bought last week or last month or last year that needs to go. We're not here to judge. We can't see your fridge. We won't even know whether you clean it out or not, but you'll probably feel better if you do. Now on to this week's engineering failure, the Challenger Space Shuttle. So just want to mention off the top, there is so much information on this accident, a lot of information, and it would be impossible for us to cover every single piece of information. So this episode is going to touch on a little bit of everything, mostly focus on the things we thought were interesting and the important takeaways to prevent these types of things from happening again. And we could probably even do like a part two episode on things that we didn't talk about. But we're not going to. But we might in the future. <laughs> and I, I hope this is what you have come to expect and love from us as a podcast and why you keep coming back for more interesting failures. Like some of the other failures we've covered, it's impossible to talk about everything. So we talk about the things we think are interesting. Also, I think it's important to note I'm not a NASA engineer. I have never worked on or designed a space shuttle, but there's still a lot of really interesting facts and good takeaways from this accident that apply to the work that I'm doing. So I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of lessons to learn here that are transferable to a lot of other disciplines and industries. So the accident happened on January 28th, 1986. Takeoff was originally scheduled for July 1985, then it moved to November, then it moved to earlier in January, before finally landing on January 28th. I have to wonder, we're going to talk a little bit about how weather impacted this launch, and I have to wonder if the shuttle had launched in July or in, in another summer month, would we still have these same issues? I think that the temperature played a decently large factor. It, it wasn't the sole cause of the accident by any means. There was lots of other things that went wrong, but the failure was exasperated by the temperature. And so I'm curious, I mean, we'll never know, but I'm curious if it had launched earlier in the year or in the summer, if that would have made a difference. So unfortunately, the Challenger broke apart 73 seconds into flight, killing all seven crew members on board and was witnessed by millions on television, including many U.S. children who were viewing the launch in school as part of the Teacher in Space program. So one of the crew on board was a U.S. teacher, and so there was a whole program surrounding having a teacher in space. And so there were a lot of children watching this at school as part of this program. And, and unfortunately, they all saw this explosion, this midair explosion on, on live TV, which is... I think it would be a pretty tragic thing to see as a, you know, as a person in school. I mean, you know, whether it's elementary school or junior high or high school. I was in my first year of, of college when September 11th happened. And I remember being able to watch that on TV. And there was, there was certainly a lot of emotion that a lot of people had related to September 11th watching this happen in real time. But if you were a, if you were a child and you were interested in space and rockets and you know, there's a teacher that was on board um, the space shuttle, which would be a really cool thing. And then, you know, less than a minute and a half into the into the launch of this, suddenly the shuttle explodes. Like that's that's a pretty tragic and drastic thing to happen and, and certainly something that nobody would expect to happen. Yeah, especially because the Challenger Orbiter had at the time 10 flights. This was it. Well, sorry, it had nine flights. This was its 10th flight. 
uh, the spacecraft itself was partially reusable. So the orbiter section was the reusable part that launched vertically and then it could land as a glider. And then the launch devices, the launch pieces, those were the parts that would break away and they would have to rebuild for the next launch. Yeah. And, and from what I understand, calling the, the space shuttle a glider is fairly generous. It glides about as well as a brick. Um, from the couple people I've talked to that have that have piloted it at some point, glider I feel is a very generous term for it. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. The Challenger also had fifteen hundred hours of flight time. It had traveled forty one point five million kilometers around the Earth. It had orbited the Earth nine hundred and ninety five times. And it hadn't been in flight for about five years. Its first flight was on April 4th through 9th in 1981. So, you know, this this Challenger orbiter has, you know, it's been around the block a few times. It, it was very shocking for it to explode after having so many successful flights. The Challenger's primary use was to conduct in-orbit research and deploy commercial, military, and scientific payloads. For this launch specifically, the shuttle consisted of the orbiter, which was the crew and the payload, the external tank, and two solid rocket boosters. The rocket boosters allowed initial takeoff, burned for two minutes, and then separated and fell back into the Atlantic Ocean under parachute, while the external tank provided fuel to the orbiter's smaller orbital maneuvering system engines. So this had a series of engines. The initial ones for initial launch would would break away, and then smaller engines on the the shuttle would continue to propel it and orbit it around the Earth. There were two O-rings which offered redundancy. They were in series, and they were noted as critically 1R, which meant that failure could result in destruction of the shuttle and loss of life. So there were two, as I said, there were two O-rings in series so that if one did fail, there was a backup. Uh, but they were still a critical piece of equipment. There were also seven crew members on board the Challenger. It was commanded by Francis Scobie, piloted by Michael Smith, mission specialist Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, and Ronald McNair, and then payload specialists Gregory Jarvis and Krista McAuliffe. Krista was supposed to be the first teacher in space, so she's the feature of that teacher in space program. Like Nicole mentioned, one of the goals of the Challenger was that it was able to deploy satellite communication systems and other payloads into space, and the intent of this mission was to deploy a communication satellite and to study Halley's Comet. Challenger launched from Launch Complex 39B at Cape Canaveral, Florida at 11.38 a.m. Eastern Time and disintegrated shortly after in the Atlantic Ocean. I don't think this plays a role in the accident, it really doesn't, but Fun fact, the Challenger had launched from Launch Complex 39A for its first nine missions, and this was the first launch from 39B, so slightly different scenery on takeoff. This is the same launch site as Apollo 1 that we covered in Episode 34, and Apollo 1 launched from Launch Complex 34. Launch Complex 39 is about 15 kilometers north of Launch Complex 34. So if you're wondering, I went down a whole rabbit hole of maps for Cape Canaveral to see how far apart these launch complexes are. 39A and B are obviously right next to each other. And then 34, which is the complex that Apollo 1 launched from, is about 15 kilometers to the south. And if you ever get the chance, I, I don't know if they still do this tour now, um, but way back in the day, you were able to, to take a tour through, through parts of um, the Cape Canaveral launch complex and... I'm guessing now a lot of it is virtual, um, but it's a really neat tour or even interactive demonstration for how spacecraft are launched and how much time it takes for spacecraft to be moved to the launch pad and then to actually be connected to all the things that are there on the launch pad. And even some of the um, the systems that, that are there for launch control things or if, if they have to abort a launch and have to put up a fire or if there's a potential fire and it has to be put out. The firefighting systems that are connected to these launch facilities are really, really cool. And, and watching them test these firefighting facilities and, and the uh, water cannons, the, the wrong word for it, but the, the valves that just dump water on potential fires is, is really, really neat to watch. All right, back on track, though. For the first four seconds of the launch, nine puffs of dark gray smoke were recorded escaping from the right-hand solid rocket booster near the strut attaching the booster to the external tank. 
The subsequent investigation determined that these smoke puffs were caused by the joint rotation. The cold temperatures prevented the O-rings from creating a good seal. At about 59 seconds into the launch, a plume of smoke was seen near the aft attached strut on the right solid rocket booster. A leak began in the liquid hydrogen tank of the external tank at 64 seconds. So we're not very far into this launch and things are going to start going really, really, really badly. So at 68 seconds, flight controllers told the crew to throttle up to 104% thrust. The crew replied with, Roger, go throttle up, which was the last communication that was heard from Challenger. At 72 seconds after launch, the right solid rocket booster pulled away from the external tank, causing lateral acceleration that was felt by the crew. At the same time, there was a large fireball on the side of the external fuel tank. Pilot said, "Uh uh-oh, this was the last speech recorded by the crew. At 73 seconds, an explosion occurred and engulfed the external tank in the orbiter. And at this point, the Challenger was 14 kilometers or 46,000 feet um, above sea level at the time and broke up into several large pieces. And it was going just under Mach 2 or tw- two times the speed of sound at, at 1.92 Mach. So about a minute into this takeoff, you start the ground crew at least starts recognizing that things are going wrong. They start seeing smoke and then the hydrogen tank starts leaking. They don't really realize quite what's going wrong because they're still operating under normal takeoff procedures. But eventually a large fireball set off on the side of the tank and an explosion occurs, ripping the the Challenger into several pieces. After a three-month search and recovery, they found many segments and fragments from the ocean floor. So this is really sad and morbid, but I think it's kind of important. They believe from the investigation that several of the crew members survived the initial breakup of the spacecraft. So they they believe that majority of the crew survived that initial explosion and that it was the impact at terminal velocity with the ocean surface that caused the loss of life of the crew. Unfortunately, this shuttle had no escape system, and so there was nothing the crew could do at that point, um, which is really, really tragic. So the reason, like Nicole mentioned, um, it is fairly sad and, and very morbid that NASA believes that a number of these crew members did uh, survive the initial explosion, and, and how they determined that was based off the position of some of the switches that were that were flipped. They were outside of their, um, you know, where they would would have been set for take off in this position in flight. So as the, or or after the space shuttle exploded and as it's going down, the astronauts that were on board were trying to do everything that they could to possibly salvage their, their craft. They wouldn't have known the flying condition of it, but they were going through everything they possibly could think of to lessen the impact or to make this somewhat survivable. So yeah, they, they, they were, they were battling the whole way down. So the Challenger cabin was made of reinforced aluminum, and that section remained in one piece after the explosion, which does help support that theory. You know, the the crew cabin was intact after the initial explosion. Three of the cu- three of the crew members activated their personal egress packs, which provided six minutes of breathable air. So they know that there were at least three crew members who were. One, awake enough, and two, using this this six minutes of, of air that they were provided in these um, egress packs. When the cabin hit the ocean surface, it was going 333 kilometers per hour. And this was about two minutes and 45 seconds after the initial explosion. Unfortunately, and this part really pisses me off, the launch escape systems were not considered during shuttle development. NASA thought the expected high reliability of the shuttle meant that it didn't need an escape mechanism. Options were also complex, high cost, and heavy weight. So, I mean, I get it. It's expensive. You think it's not possible. You don't need that redundancy. The shuttle is highly reliable, and therefore you don't need an escape mechanism. I just think that's really ignorant. You're putting people in this and you're sending them to space and you're not offering a backup plan. And I think that's really dumb. I do understand, I I think, where NASA is coming from on this. The the amount of time that the space shuttle or, or, you know, any sort of system that's going to space is within the atmosphere or, or, you know, at a point where where an escape system would be viable, Um, you know, outside of a complete secondary 
you know, rocket type system in the, in the same way that they have on the International Space Station. And, and as far as a cost benefit analysis, I, I think that NASA probably just erred on the, the fact that if they made the, the shuttle very reliable, the amount of time that the shuttle system would be traveling within the atmosphere and, you know, in a survivable escape pod type system, it would be it would be very minimal. Unfortunately, this isn't the only shuttle that, that NASA has lost. And this is not the only loss of life incident that NASA, you know, experienced up until that point or, you know, in, in, in the future. So unfortunately, these things do happen in, in space travel and, and space exploration. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I just think that, you know, a, a few of the failures that we've talked about, I wouldn't say all of them because they're all different causes, but, you know, several of them have just thought that the bad thing that happened couldn't happen. And so they never had a plan for it. Even two episodes about, you know, United Flight 232, they thought that the loss of all flight controls was impossible. And so they had no plan for it. Yet they had all three hydraulic systems converging at one spot on the plane. So to me, that's totally possible. I think, you know, and, and to be fair to the the NASA engineers, there's a lot of moving parts here and they don't have full control. And we're going to kind of get into that later. And NASA's response, it sounds like there's a lot of pressure on NASA for, you know, space exploration. And there's not a lot of, you know, they're, they're dealing with fairly tight budgets. So the engineers don't always have the ability to say, no, you can't do that. Yes, we need redundancy. They don't, they don't always have that freedom. They don't have con- complete control over over the thing that they're designing. I just think it just seems so silly to me. And maybe this is me looking back in hindsight's 2020, but you know, the shuttle exploded and they didn't have a way out. And if they had a way out, this crew could still be alive today. I feel like that's, you know, it's it's at least worth talking about and thinking about. Modern spacecraft that have been developed, I'm going to say over the last, you know, the last decade or so, um, you know, SpaceX Crew Dragon, they do have an escape system that's built in to some of their 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 systems or, or, their, or their spacecraft. And, you know, I think that's something, you know, really interesting to think about. So this this accident, this Challenger accident happened in 1986. And so, you know, that's that's 30. Sit, how old am I? That's like 35, 36 years ago this year. So sorry if that's the year you were born and I just made you feel old. I made myself feel old in the process, too. So don't worry. Um Oh, no, I'm way older than that. Yeah, Brian's pretty old. So, you know, I, I realized that this was the 80s and they're still learning. And, you know, th- again, that's a that's an important part of these failures that we're talking about is that stuff happens and s- things slip through the cracks and accidents occur and we change. We adapt. Think about what car you were driving in 1986. And that, that probably had like engineering that had been done in the last, say, five years. Space shuttle stuff takes a long time to engineer. So they were working off stuff they developed back in the 1970s. Not probably the greatest on the safety front. But modern spacecraft, um, SpaceX Crew Dragon, they do have escape systems that are in place. And those allow the crew kind of to escape in the first, uh, I, I believe, um, from the, the fueling stage up until 40 minutes or so after, after launch there. So over time like everything we've seen in vehicle development and building development and just any kind of engineering development, safety becomes more and more prevalent and people develop safety systems. So modern spacecraft, at least some of them do have the ability for astronauts and other crew members to possibly escape from their spacecraft. So the cause of the Challenger disaster was determined by the Rogers commission was the failure of two redundant O-ring seals in a joint of the solid rocket booster. So, like Nicole mentioned, when they launched, or on the day of the launch, the temperatures were really low, which reduced the elasticity of the rubber O-rings, and they could no longer seal the joint in the way that they were supposed to. So, if you live in a cold climate, or if you don't live in a cold climate, rubber rubber shrinks when it gets colder. So, if the if the O-ring was was designed to ensure a certain tolerance on that solid rocket booster, so that fuel wouldn't leak um, into a different section of it. When it was when it was really cold out, the rubber would contract a little bit, and that would exceed the the tolerance, which allowed the seal to fail. Yeah, and rubber also um, is less pliable when it's cold, so not not the same thing. But 
these are the reasons the the fact that it shrinks and the fact that it becomes like a rock is why i have winter tires in alberta's cold climate because i want my tires to be a you know to have a little bit more movement and be able to to shape to the road instead of just being you know curling pucks going down the road so for people that don't live in climates where winter tires are are a necessity for at least six months of the year the, the compound, the rubber compound that's used in winter tires is much different than the compounds that are used in summer tires or all season tires. So at the at lower temperatures we experience here in Canada, it allows the tires to be much grippier than an all season or a summer tire. And the tread pattern is a little different as well, just so it sheds snow instead of sheds rain. But the rubber compound makes a, makes a huge difference um, in the temperatures. So engineers on the day of the launch, they recommended against launching until the temperature was at least 12 degrees Celsius. The forecast for January 28th was minus 8 degrees Celsius overnight and minus 3 by 9.30 a.m. So it's quite a bit below the recommended temperature. The overnight measurements of the solid rocket boosters recorded minus 4 for the left side and minus 13 for the right side. Temperature at the time of launch was 2 degrees Celsius. So 10 degrees off of where they wanted it to be. You know, that's at least one one coat layer. I'm a multi-layered winter person. <laughs> I don't like being cold. Yeah, actually, that's a good way to think about it, Nicole. It's, uh, you know, 12 degrees. It's like I'd probably just throw on like a, you know, a down jacket or, you know, something lighter. But it, but at two degrees, it's like you're, you're throwing on the on the gloves and the, and the toque or the beanie, depending where in the world you're from. They're the same kind of hat. We just call them different names. Yeah. So when the seals didn't seal... There was a breach in the joint shortly after liftoff, allowing the pressurized gas within the boosters to burn through the walls to the external fuel tank. And that's when the really bad things happen. Yes. So like all accidents of this nature, there was a formal investigation. So Ronald Reagan, who was president of the United States at the time, created what's called the Rogers Commission to investigate the Challenger shuttle accident. And so the official cause... So they've they've listed a number of causes. Um, they all kind of stem from the O-rings, uh, but there's there's a few more issues, specifically with you know NASA's operational decisions and some additional test data. Um, and I think these are all really interesting. And like I mentioned earlier, I think you know even though I don't design rockets for a living, I think a lot of these things, especially on the operational side. And the decision making process side are transferable into the work that I'm doing. I don't think that you even need to be an engineer to see to transfer some of these issues, I guess, or or lessons learned into your area of work. So they they noted that there was failure of the casing joint in the right hand solid rocket booster, which is due to the O rings. There was also some issues with NASA's organizational culture and decision-making processes. So we saw similar problems with the Apollo 1 accident, which was 19 years and one day earlier. So also, interestingly, a January launch. I don't think the temperature was an issue for Apollo 1, at least not to the extent that it was for the Challenger. But it's still interesting to think about how things like winter weather, uh, which we're so used to in Canada, can debilitate an area that doesn't usually experience those types of conditions. You know, this seems pretty straightforward, as I say it out loud, but it always takes me a second to understand places that don't have winter. Uh, I've done some projects in California and they put water outside. And I'm like, well, wait, 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 won't it freeze? And you can't put water outside, it might freeze. And they're like, it doesn't freeze here. I I have also run into this for you projects in places (laughs) where the ground doesn't freeze or, um, you know, something, you know, things that we would commonly design for in, you know, Canada and northern Alberta, northern BC. It's in an area of the world that suddenly doesn't have this sort of thing. It's uh, it's a little nerve wracking the, the first couple of times. So you're like, am I missing something? I feel like I'm really missing something in this design. Yeah. You're like, what do you mean you don't have winter? What do- I don't understand. Like my brain does not compute that concept at all. I'm just like, what? I, like I get it logically, but I can't. My brain just doesn't want to work that way. It's like, no, you must allow for winter. Yeah, actually, I, I lived in the Caribbean uh, for for a year, many, many years ago. And it was really weird not to have four seasons. Like up here, we're used to four seasons or sometimes more because we, we get a false spring somewhere, usually around February, where it warms up to 20 degrees. And you think you're done with the winter, but that's, that's just a giant lie. But having two seasons, which was essentially a wet season and a dry season, was really different for me, at least. 
Yeah, I, w- I don't think I... I mean, I say that I wouldn't like it. It'd be nice to have, like, warm weather all the time. But I, I do kind of like the seasons. They keep things interesting. Plus, you know, in the summer, and maybe it's because our summers are so short, but in the summer, I'm always doing stuff because it's nice outside and so I'm riding my bike or I'm going for a run or I'm playing sports or I'm hanging out at the park and then you know by the time we get to winter I'm ready to hibernate I want to just cozy up under a pile of blankets and read a book and take a nap usually (laughs) so I kind of like winter I think I think it's cozy I I like it yeah, you can you can definitely hibernate in winter. And, and one of my favorite things actually about summer is the days get super long. Like we'll have we'll have sunlight until eleven p.m. and then it'll be dark for a few hours. And then by six, before six, it's it's light out again. So we get these super long mm-hmm. sunlight days, days of sunlight. Test data from as early as nineteen seventy seven, or nine years before the accident, showed how big of a design flaw and how big of a risk. A failure the o-rings actually were despite warnings from nasa engineers nasa management and the manufacturer found the wide tolerances to be acceptable the nasa engineers also warned managers about temperature concerns launching in january but it fell on deaf ears i'm shocked i'm completely shocked brian that's completely that's something shocked. like that has never happened before ever never i can't believe it this is all sarcasm people in case you can't tell this is ridiculous to me like this is this is one of the the really frustrating things about this accident in hindsight is there were a lot of things that were pointing to this launch should have been delayed until warmer weather or later in the afternoon or later that week the o-rings i believe that the cost for them was less than a dollar each the the risk was no one you know certainly you know in the, in the previous nine years they'd done they'd done a number of studies people knew how these o-rings performed at low temperatures and the decision was made to go ahead with this launch and unfortunately it, it led to the death of seven people that were televised the loss of a shuttle and a shutdown of the nasa shuttle program for a considerable period of time when they while well, they tried to figure out what had gone wrong with this One of the things, too, that I thought was really, I'm going to say interesting, I mean frustrating, was that the material that were used to make the O-ring, that recipe was only known by the O-ring manufacturer, and they could change it at any point, whenever they wanted, without certification or approval, which I think is ridiculous. And they also didn't have very strong obviously didn't have very strong specifications or requirements for quality control because you know i certainly don't design rockets for a living but my specs a lot better than that we care about the pipe material that you're using and you know the velocities of water that it can handle and the types of fittings that you're using and making sure it's compatible with um, with the fluid that you have and tolerances that are acceptable For them to just let something that's so critical just go so unprotected is just, uh, it's ridiculous to me. I'm fairly certain like the O-rings in your your tap or in your faucet probably have better tolerances than these ones here, or at least, you know, better better quality control. Yeah, agreed. And last time I checked, if your tap is leaking, it's not a super critical thing. No, no, it's not going to explode. But still, it's people care. So correcting the joint seal problem was possible by redesigning and manufacturing new joints before the accident, but schedules and costs were higher priority than flight safety, unfortunately. One other important thing to note is that there was no evidence of joint contamination, fracture, or other damage contributing to the accident. So this is solely caused by the failure of two O-rings. And with respect to the O-ring specifically, as the joint rotated, the tang and the clevis bent away from each other, reduced pressure on the O-rings, weakening their seals, allowing combustion gases to erode the O-rings. The O-rings could no longer contain the burning propellant gases under the range of operating conditions expected during takeoff and flight. The field joints of the solid rocket booster should have been redesigned to provide the following features and much improved factor of safety. Seems like a no-brainer to me. But, you know, hindsight, again, hindsight's twenty twenty. So they should have redesigned the movement in the joint. They should have improved the spacing between the tang and the clevis, which are the two arms that make up both sides of the joint. Um, the tag would be the plug side and the clevis would be the socket side. 
Uh, they needed to add seals that can withstand high and low temperatures, as well as all dynamic thermal and structural loadings, which to be fair is, is a lot to ask of an O-ring, but you know, in this instance, I think that's a necessary ask. And, and of course, the O-rings needed to adequately seal without the use of putty. The putty is supposed to be, you know, we haven't talked about the putty yet, but the putty is supposed to be kind of an extra layer of protection. We're not supposed to rely solely on the putty for the O-rings to remain intact. And then they also sh needed protection against insulation debonding and the propellant crackings. The decision to launch was based on a faulty engineering analysis of the joint seal behavior. The shuttle safety, reliability, and quality assurance program failed to exercise control over the problem tracking systems, didn't critique the engineering analysis, and didn't provide an independent perspective during the flight readiness reviews. Pressure from management led to the discounting of proper technical concerns and engineering judgment. NASA decided to launch despite uncertainty represented by ice forming on the fixed service structure and didn't make a reasonable effort to mitigate avoidable risks to the shuttle. In fact, the shuttle shouldn't have been permitted until the ice was cleared from the platform. The launch director didn't place safety above all else with regards to launch readiness. And there seems to be differing requirements to define readiness, leading to failures in communication between NASA and its contractors. The investigation found that the fuel tank itself, while it did explode, did not contribute to the accident, and that the forces of the failed solid rocket booster are what ruptured the fuel tank wall, and were forces above and beyond reasonable design considerations. So I just want to uh, recap that here for a second, and and this is based on my biased opinion of being a, a practicing engineer. Um, you know... From what it sounds like, the engineer said, whoa, 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 we got a problem here. And management said, too bad, this this bird's got to fly. And I don't think it was quite so black and white. Um, you know, maybe the engineers didn't blow the whistle loud enough, which, not saying it's their fault, but but per perhaps they they didn't convey the message clearly enough to be heard. Perhaps they did. And management said you know, oh, well, it's not that big of a risk. I just want to circle back to this because I think this is really, really important, especially if you're an engineer. You are going to encounter people in your career that are going to say, that are going to try to pressure you to make certain types of decisions to their benefit. And sometimes those are your clients that are paying your bills and hiring you for more work. And, and a lot of times, you know, not... A lot of clients are good, but some of them dangle carrots of future work in hopes that they can pressure you into making certain decisions. I'm not saying those decisions are necessarily even all bad. Sometimes they're just different. You know, there's there's more than one way to, from A to B. But I think it's really, really important to to your career, to your liability insurance, and, you know, to the integrity of the profession that when someone suggests something that's a bad idea, that you say no. Don't allow yourself to get pressured into making poor decisions or, you know, allowing things that, that, you know, are unsafe to, to happen because of, of external pressures. You know, as an engineer, our first duty is to public safety. And that is, that's really why our profession is regulated in the first place, to make sure that these things that we're building for the public use, buildings and bridges and roads and shuttles and airplanes and cars that 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 they keep people safe that's kind of our primary objective and i think it's really really important that we keep that front of mind and that we don't allow ourselves to be bullied into making poor decisions and and it happens all the time really like i, I don't know brian if you experience that in your career i i get it a lot and it, it's not that the it's not that the clients want us to make bad decisions it's just that they their focus is saving money and yeah, building buildings. They often have different priorities or their sure. schedule priority. And way back when I when I first started doing engineering, one of the, the people that I got to work with, I um, had the pleasure of working with, he kind of stated in a way where he's like, if you're on with if if you're on the fence about whether this is a good decision or a bad decision, just think that if something went wrong and you had to sit down in front of a, a review board and you can't justify why you made this decision he's like it's probably not a good decision to make so if you're if you're on the fence about something or you're having doubts about something kind of think about it like that if something went wrong would you be able to defend why you made that 
decision or, you know, reduced something. Yeah. And I mean, I can tell you for sure that the client's not going to stand behind you at that review board defending your decision. That's on you to bear that alone. And then, you know, if that review board decides you shouldn't be practicing and you made a big mistake, they'll, they take your stamp. And then, then what are you going to do? There's other options, but do you really want to, you know, start your career over or have that limitation put on your potential because you made a really bad decision because someone pressured you into it? And depending on the severity or where you are in the world, you can go to jail for an engineering decision that you made. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think about this a lot. I actually do presentations for ASSET, the Association of Science and Engineering Technologists of Alberta. I go into polytechnic school classrooms and I talk to them about, you know, about about why getting a designation is important, but I also talk to them about the ethics. So this is something I think about a lot. The person who should care most about this is is us as the engineers. And I think it's really, really important, like I said, to the integrity of our profession, you know, that you make good engineering decisions, at, at least to the best of your ability. You know, no one's no one's perfect. Things slip through the cracks. Stuff happens, but that's why we have peer reviews. That's why we have codes. That's why we have standards. It's so that, you know, all of these things, all of these failures that we've talked about that have happened before us have taught us a lot of different things about what not to do. And we need to look at them, pay attention, and not repeat them. So what was the aftermath of the Challenger disaster? Yeah, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox. The accident led to a 32-month hiatus of the space shuttle program, which I think is fair. They got a lot of stuff to sort out, a lot of things to learn, a lot of issues to digest. The Endeavor, uh, which launched in 1992, replaced the Challenger with a redesigned solid rocket booster, And as well, the crew wore pressure suits during takeoff and landing, which just provides an extra level of protection. I don't know for sure, but I did not read anything about the Endeavor having a escape system. So the Endeavor does not have an escape system. None of the shuttles developed for the shuttle program, the STS program, had escape systems. So we didn't learn that lesson. We did not learn that lesson. (laughs) So the surface recovery efforts reached. 12 aircraft and eight ships by 7 p.m. on the day of the accident. And that lasted until February 7th, so a little over a week. And then the subsurface recovery efforts, they got as large as 16 ships. And that started on February 8th and lasted until April 29th. The recovery efforts went on for about three months after the accident until they were able to get, it's unlikely that they got every single piece, but they definitely got enough to be able to do a full investigation and kind of piece together what happened. So there you have it. Two little O-rings led to a catastrophic explosion of the Challenger space shuttle 73 seconds after liftoff. For photos, sources, and an episode summary from this week's episode, head to failureology.ca. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please rate, review, and subscribe to Failureology so more people can find us. If you want to chat with us, our Twitter handle is at Failureology. You can email us at thefailureologypodcast at gmail.com. You can connect with us on LinkedIn, or you can reach us on our Patreon page. Check out the show notes for links to all of these. Thanks everyone for listening and tune into the next episode where we'll talk about Kowloon Walled City, what was once the most densely populated spot on Earth. Bye everyone. Talk soon.